that our first speaker is Sean Eberhard from Cambridge, and he'll be talking about an asymptotic for the Hall page conjecture. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, thank you very much um, for tuning in, everybody. Uh, I think this is a really great thing if we can uh, keep this going, and um, it'd be really great if we could foster a sort of seminar-like environment. So um, please don't be afraid to, to interrupt. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, I see some nods, so I'll just press on. Um, <clears throat> So I want to talk about uh, something called the Hall page conjecture. Um, it's a conjecture in combinatorial group theory. Um, it's not going, it won't obviously seem related to additive combinatorics for a while, but just bear with me and we'll get there eventually. Um, so, uh, let's see, come quick forward. So everything here is joint work with Freddie Manners and Rudy Mrazovich. Uh, Freddie is in San Diego and Rudy is Zagreb. Rudy's in the room. Um, I don't think Freddie is. Freddie's probably asleep. But um, I, want you, I want you guys to be able to picture these guys in case you don't know them. So I found a nice picture of them together in Ober Um So there. Now, now you can picture them perfectly. So great. <clears throat> okay, so to introduce the Hall page conjecture, I want to just remind you of um, something called Euler's 36 officers problem. So this was a problem, this was a toy problem of, of Euler. And the question is, you have 36 officers of six different ranks and six different regiments, and you want to arrange them into a six by six grid so that no two officers of the same rank or regiment appear together in the same row or column. Okay, so it's quite a, quite a mouthful, but um, you can see that this, they've started to put together a solution here. So they've got uh, a red regiment, a blue regiment, a green regiment, and the officers they've arranged are not sharing a row or column yet. And I guess they're using different hats to, to mark regiments. Um, okay, it's a confusing way of, uh, of thinking about it. So more normal way of thinking about it is you want to find, um, the question is, does there exist a so-called uh, Greco-Latin square, which is six by six? So a Latin square, um, you probably know, is it's an n by n square filled with the symbols one through n in such a way that no um, row or column has two, two of the same symbol. And a Greco-Latin square is two of these uh, superposed so that the n squared symbols, n squared pairs of symbols, which appear, are all distinct. So those, those two squares are called um, uh, mutually orthogonal. Um, and the question is, is there a six by six one of these things? So Euler was interested in this because um, it's easy to do for five by five and it's easy to do for seven by seven, but it seemed impossible uh, to do for six by six. And that's what Euler conjectured. So I've written down, um, this is a, I guess an Arabic Latin square because I'm using Arabic numerals and Latin, Latin letters. But um, you can see that I've, I've written in the, the numbers in a very systematic way. I've, writ I've actually written down the cyclic Latin square. Um, of the six by six cyclic Latin square. So in row I column J, I have I plus J mod six. And the object, um, what you want to do to complete this puzzle is to fill out the letters A, B, C, D, E, F in such a way that, um, that the, those letters form a Latin square and also so that the, the 36 pairs of symbols are all different. And the reason I'm talking about this is um, in this particular case where I've fixed the first Latin square to be a cyclic Latin square, it's actually easy to see that it's impossible. And you can see that by just looking at where I've placed the A symbols. So um, there's actually a, a simple parity obstruction. Um, and, that's, and that's the following. If you look at where I, going to put all the A symbols. I've put them in the 
these three places and then here and here and then I got stuck. Um, that's supposed to be one of each row and one of each column. And if you add up all the values in all those places, well, the value in row i column j is i plus j mod 6. So if you add up all those values, you're going to get the sum of all the elements in the group twice. And the sum of everything in z mod 6 twice is 0, whereas the sum of everything in z mod 6 once is a 3. So it's just, it's clearly impossible if you start with a cyclic Latin square. So, um, so I'm using this to motivate the, the main definition, the sort of main object of study for this talk, which is a so-called complete mapping. So a complete mapping is a bijection from the group to itself, such that um, f, such that x times f of x is also a bijection. So what's the relation? Well, I was looking at where I put the a entries here, and you have to have one of each, one in each row and one in each column. So you can think of that as the graph of a bijection. And then the requirement that the entries be all distinct is exactly saying that this bijection satisfies that x times f of x is also a bijection. So, okay, so that motivates this definition of a complete mapping. Um, here are a couple of easy examples. So if the order of the group is odd, then I can just take the identity map. I mean, the identity map times the identity map is the squaring map. And if the order of the group is odd, then that's a bijection. So that works. Um, as another example, I could take F2 to the D. And if I, if I make the ansatz that, um, that the map is linear over F2, then the definition is equivalent to saying that this linear map does not have an eigenvalue. The, the condition that uh, the bijection is saying that it doesn't have zero as an eigenvalue and the condition that x times f of x is a bijection is saying that one's not an eigenvalue. So uh, linear maps without eigenvalues exist, so complete mappings exist. Um, and yeah, so it's, so it's an easy lemma to, to that um, the existence of a complete mapping is equivalent to the multiplication table of G having an orthogonal mate. So um, yeah, so this is the, the object of interest for the purpose of this talk. And the uh, 36 officers problem, I gave that as an example to convince you to, to care about this, at least for the sake of an hour. Um, but if you, don't, if you aren't convinced by that motivation, I don't really blame you. It's kind of a strange combinatorial problem. Um, in which case, I, I'm going to offer you somewhat more honest motivation, which is just the it's a sort of because it's there type motivation. Um, the, the definition of a complete mapping, it's something which is very awkward from the point of view of group theory, like saying that you have a, a bijection and you multiply it by the identity and that should be a bijection again. I mean, that doesn't cooperate with any of the usual group theory operations like commutators or nil potency or anything. Um, basically, the only reason that complete mappings should exist is just that there's kind of no reason they shouldn't exist. Um, and that's kind of a, um, that's, that's, that's on topic for this um, seminar. As in, it's, it's a very common situation in analytic number theory where like, if you want to prove like gold box conjecture, for instance, I mean, uh, the only reason you think that even numbers should be the sum of two primes is because there's no reason they shouldn't be. Um, but proving that can be very difficult and, um, it requires understanding the distribution of primes much better than we currently do. So you can think of it as a, it's a because it's there type of combinatorial question about groups. Okay, so let us assume that we consider complete mappings to be interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so what about this thing I said about the six by six Latin square? This, the six, six by six Latin square not having an orthogonal mate. So this works for any, any cyclic group of even order. It's just a simple observation that the sum of all the elements in a cyclic group of even order is non-zero. The, the sum of all the elements in Cn is n over two. And that's clearly true of any bijection of the group as well. 
So if I take two bijections uh, and add them together, then that function has the property that the sum of all its values is zero, not n over two. And so it can't be a bijection. It's a very simple uh, parity obstruction to the existence of a complete mapping. So this works in any cyclic group of even order. It also works in any odd extension of a cyclic group of even order. Um, it's the same, same thing. Um, so the, the general condition is called the whole page condition, or at least that's what we call it. And the condition states that, um, that the sum of all the elements in the group is trivial in the abelianization. So uh, to remind you, the abelianization is the quotient of the group by the commutator subgroup. So this is the largest abelian quotient of the group. Um, and you clearly, if you have a complete mapping, it must be the case that the sum of all your elements is trivial in the abelianization. Um, part of what's going on here is if I have an arbitrary non-abelian group, um, it doesn't really make sense to just take the product of all the elements in the group because I need to specify the order in which I do that. That's why you need to pass to the abelianization before you even state this condition. Okay, but you can, you can think of this roughly as the whole page condition is saying that you're not an odd extension of a cyclic group of even order. Um, so let me just give you some examples of some groups that do satisfy the whole page condition, just to convince you that it's not a very restrictive um, condition. So I've just written the definition again here, just the sum of all the elements is, is trivial in the abelianization. So modulo the commutator subgroup. Um, so Holland Page wrote this in sort of more standard group theoretic language. They, they said that, um, and this is the way it's normally written. Um, they proved that you satisfy this condition if and only if your C love two subgroups are trivial or non-cyclic. So as long as your C love two subgroup is not C2, uh, or C4 or C8, um, et cetera, then you satisfy this condition. Um, but you don't, but you don't, but if you don't like that definition, you can ignore it because it's not really important for the for the sake of for the rest of the talk. It's actually much, it's actually more natural for this talk to just think of the whole page condition in this form. So um, so for instance, any simple group. Um, satisfies the whole page condition trivially, or any perfect group, because if the abelianization itself is trivial, then of course all the elements in the group must uh, have trivial sum in the abelianization. That's trivial. Uh, any group of odd order also, um, same thing. In fact, any non solvable group at all satisfies the whole page condition. Although that's quite non-trivial. The proof of that uses the fake Thompson theorems. So the fake Thompson theorem, uh, also called the odd order theorem, this is the thing that says that if you have a group of, if you have a simple non-abelian simple group, its order is even. Uh, okay, and it, it really, it's actually equivalent to that. But um, So, okay, so, so the point is, there's this trivial necessary condition, a sort of parity condition called the whole page condition. But the point is that um, this seems to be the only, the only thing that we can write down. That it seems to be the only obvious obstruction to the existence of a complete mapping. And that's what Hall, pa Hall and Page conjectures. So the Hall Page conjecture states that if you have a group, as long as it satisfies the Hall Page condition, then it has a complete mapping. Um, so Hall and Page conjectured that in 1955, and then it was finally proved in 2009 um, through combined work of Wilcox, Evans, and Bray. So um, quite a gap between when it was conjectured and when it was finally proved. Let me give you um, a little bit of a little bit of a run through of the Wilcox, Evans proof, or the proof. Yeah, the Wilcox, Evans proof. Wilcox Evans Bray proof, sorry. So uh, Hall and Page, when they made their conjecture, basically did everything that they could do at the time. 
They proved it for solvable groups. They proved it for symmetric and alternating groups. Um, they did. They did most of what they what they could think of with the technology available in 1955. So 1955 is before the classification of finite simple groups. We didn't even know about the existence of of any. I don't think we knew about the existence of any sporadic groups other than Mathieu groups. Um, but they made this conjecture. Uh, and then the next, over the next few decades, that's when the classification was proved. So that's when uh, the, the landscape and group theory changed completely over the next few decades. And then, and there were, and there were some results on the whole page conjecture. So for people who cared about the whole page conjecture, they would prove it for various classes of groups like PSL2 or P, you know, various, various things. Um, Ashbacher did various work proving it for a, a few big, big classes of groups. But um, the big breakthrough came with Wilcox's work in 2009. Wilcox, first of all, reduced it to, reduced the conjecture to the case of simple groups, which is quite a natural thing to want to do. And it's, and, uh, there's kind of a natural way to do that, but it it's, doesn't seem to quite work and he managed to get it to work. So, um, but using, but still fairly elementary, using fairly elementary tools. Um, uh, so he reduced it to the case of simple groups and then he also proved it uh, for all simple groups of Lie type. So if you don't know, um, what the classification states is that all non-abelian simple groups come in a few, a few specific families. So there's the family of alternating groups. So that was already handled by Paul and Page here. Um, there's the family of all uh, simple groups of Lie type. And then there are 26 ex exceptions. There are 26 sporadic groups. So Wilcox, um, Wilcox, in, a, in his paper, reduced it to simple groups and proved it for all simple groups of Lie type. So that leaves only 26 uh, sporadic groups that needs to be proved for. But it's still extremely non-trivial because these are huge groups and it's very difficult to brute force check this conjecture. Um, so Evans, in the same year, and using Wilcox's technology, checked this using computer algebra for um, all, of the, all of the sporadic groups except the largest Yenko group, this group called J4. And then Bray claimed to have checked it for J4 as well. And Bray's, Bray's work finally appeared in, in 2019. So that's, that's the proof. That, that's the proof. It's the reduction to, class, reduction to simple groups, checked it for all groups of Lie type, and then checked it very tediously using computer algebra for um, for all the sporadic groups, and then finally J4. Okay. Um, so, so let's change perspective a little bit and say, suppose we're not just interested in uh, whether they exist, but how many there are. It's a very natural approach to, to um, showing that something exists. I mean, it's, it's sort of, founding principle of probabilistic combinatorics, right? If you want to show something that exists, just count them. Um, and if the result is positive, then they exist. Um, so let's just take for simplicity, you take the cyclic group of order n. And as we've been talking about, you need to take n to be odd. Otherwise, the answer is just zero. Um, and I'm going to write cm for the number of complete mappings. So there was a conjecture by Vardy and Wanless um, that said that the number of complete mappings should be basically n factorial over e to the n. Uh, and okay, so Wanless stated this in this form in 2011, and Vardy stated it in 20 years previously in a in a weaker form. But um, the, the the dates give you some idea of how I mean progress on this was was slow, it seems. Um, uh, so why would you guess this? So it's very natural. It's a very natural thing to guess, actually, because you just say, well, I'm trying to count things. I'm trying to count bijections. 
such that the identity plus that bijection is again a bijection. And if I just take the first bijection to be random, then, okay, what is identity plus a random bijection? That's basically just an, another random function. So in the absence of, of a better idea of what's going on, we might just think, okay, that's, that's going to be a bijection with probability n factorial over n to the n. So that's where this conjecture comes from. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this, this kind of counting heuristic. I feel like this is the most, uh, the broadest interest part of the talk. Um, I want to think more carefully about this heuristic uh, and still heuristically, but more systematically. So let's call this model zero. So model zero, so we're gonna take a, we're gonna take a random bijection of our group, still the cyclic group of odd order. So random bijection called pi, say. And um, I'm going to say psi of x is x plus pi of x. And model zero is just the, it's just the dumb idea that um, psi is, a, again, a random function. We know kind of nothing about it. So let's just imagine that it's a random function. And then if we believe model zero, then we'll guess that the number of complete mappings is, is the number of choices of pi, which is n factorial, times the probability under model zero that psi is a random by, or that psi is a bijection, which is n factorial over n to the n. So how good is, is model zero? Okay, who knows? Maybe it's okay. Um, but a slightly better model would be model one which is the model where you remember the whole page condition. So the whole page condition, I mean, in this case, it's sort of, because we're in a cyclic group of odd order, it's kind of working for us. So we know that every bijection has the property that the sum of all its values is zero. So the set of all functions which satisfy this condition is a, is a subgroup of the set of all functions. It's a subgroup of index n. And Psi of x is the sum of two bijections. It's the sum of the identity plus another bijection. So it's automatically in this subgroup. It automatically has the property that the sum of all its values is zero. So it should be correspondingly more likely to be a bijection. Um, the, the probability that it's a bijection should be, should be larger by the index of this subgroup. Okay, another way of thinking about this, which is, which is maybe easier, is just saying, suppose that, um, Suppose that I've checked the first n minus one values and they're all correct, as in they're all distinct. Well, the nth value is automatically distinct again because the sum of all the values is, is zero. So that, that just means you're done. Okay, so that's model one. Um, but what I really wanna talk about is model two. So model two comes from the observation that psi of x has a, Psi of x is actually more prone to collisions than you would guess under model one. So if I take two different points um, in the group and I just, I estimate the probability, I calculate the probability that under model one that psi of x equals psi of y. Well, that's just, I mean, this condition that the sum of all the values in, are zero, that doesn't really make a difference. So this is just the probability that two different values drawn from the group uniformly at random are the same, which is one over n. Whereas if I look at the true probability that psi of x equals psi of y, well, this is the probability that pi of x minus pi of y is y minus x. And then writing it in this way, well, pi of x minus pi of y is a random non-zero value. And, x, and y minus x is also non-zero. So this probability is actually one over n minus one. So psi of x is actually slightly more likely to make values collide. Um, and so it should be correspondingly less likely to be a bijection. But we're, but we're now in this kind of strange position where we're trying to imagine what a random function is like, which is basically uniform, except that it's more prone to collisions. Um, and it's not quite 
it's not quite clear how to think about what that thing is. Um, but there's a nice principle called the principle of maximum entropy. Um, so just the, I've just rewritten exactly what was on the previous slide. So the um, the expected number of collisions in psi one is n minus one over two, but the expected number of collisions in psi is a bit larger, it's n over two. And uh, the principle of maximum entropy is trying to answer, um, is, is, trying to, is trying to tell us uh, what we can think of, how we, how we should think of the distribution of psi. And what it says, um, it's a sort of mathematical version of Occam's razor. It's sort of saying, um, assuming what you know, assume that you're as stupid as possible. As in the distribution which best reflects what you currently believe is the one which, okay, it satisfies everything you know, but other than that, it has the largest entropy possible. So for instance, under, under you, you can write, you can think of model zero and model one in this way too. So model zero was the case where I don't know anything at all. And so I'll just assume it has the, it's the maximum entropy distribution as in the uniform distribution. And then model one was the, was the, was the situation where, okay, I observed that it's supported on a subgroup. And then, okay, the maximum entropy distribution is the uniform distribution on that subgroup. And now with model two, I'm trying to incorporate slightly more interesting information. I'm trying to incorporate a, a count of the number of collisions. Um, so you can actually write this as a, um, so it, it's a, to try to figure out what model two should be, we can just write down a sort of optimization problem that sort of says, I want to maximize the entropy given the, given what I know. And what I know is that, okay, it's supported. I've written H for this for this subgroup, set of all functions um, such that the sum of all the values is zero. And I know that my, my probability distribution is um, supported on that subgroup. And I'm also making the constraint that the expected number of collisions in my distribution is n over two. So I've got some constraints, but beyond those, I want to maximize the entropy. And you can do that. You can, you know, introduce a Lagrange multiplier, as you usually do. The but the solution is that your distribution should should be this Gibbs distribution. So the Gibbs distribution is you start with the uniform distribution, but you you renormalize it slightly. You say, I'm going to multiply the I'm going to take the density to be e to the beta number of collisions, where beta is some parameter. Um, and in order for that to be a, for that to be a probability dis distribution, I need to, um, include some normalizing factor. So that normally, that normalizing factor is called the partition function. And you can think of that as just the expected value of this, of this normalization under model one, basically. Okay, so I've decided that model two is going to be this Gibbs distribution. And so it now has this parameter beta involved. Uh, and what is beta? So beta needs to be chosen so that the expected number of collisions is what I know it to be, as in it should be n over two. The expected number of collisions can be written in terms of this partition function as the derivative of the log. And okay, under model one, the number of collisions, I mean, that's kind of a rare event. So we might imagine that that's, uh, has a roughly Poisson distribution. We know it's expected value. So we can, we can, we can approximate Z beta by this formula here. Um, and if I do that, then uh, you can see that I need to choose beta to be one over N basically. And this normalizing factor z beta is, is going to be approximately e to the one half. Okay, so that's great. Um, note, by the way, that if 
under model two, if I'm looking for the probability that psi two is actually a bijection, then this collision counter, this number of collisions for a bijection is of course zero. Um, so I'm writing, by the way, I'm writing collisions in case it isn't clear for number of pairs of elements of the group that are colliding into the function. So for a bijection, that's clearly zero. So in that case, I'm just, I just have the usual uniform distribution divided by this, by this partition function. Okay, so let's go back to this heuristic. So I said under model zero, the number of complete mappings we believe is n factorial times n factorial over n to the n. Under model one, that gets corrected by a factor of n. And under model two, I need to include this factor of the partition function. So I include this extra factor of e to the minus one half. Um, but I should caution that uh, it's very unclear that we're done at this point. Like it's, it's kind of hard to know when to stop. There might be some model three where I count, where I make some other observation about psi and I get more information and I somehow need to incorporate that into my, into my conjecture. Um, maybe I'm counting like the number of triples of points that all collide or the number of pairs of pairs of points which each collide or something. I mean, um, there's no reason that this process should stop. And the only reason to guess that it, that we're kind of done at this point is, to, is just to say, well, I, I tried some other, I made some other observations. I tried to make some further corrections and they didn't seem to make a difference at the level of approximation that I'm, that I'm working on. Um, so, yeah. However, um, so this is, this, this guess in this form is actually what we proved. So I'll, um, this was in, this was work in 2015. Um, and we proved that the number of complete mappings in the, in the cyclic group of odd order is given by this formula asymptotically. Um, so e to the minus one half times n factorial squared divided by n to the n minus one. And that n minus one is taking account this extra factor of n. So this, this in particular, this proves this Vardy one-less conjecture, but it's actually much more precise than, than what they conjectured because we're pinning it down to a factor of one plus the lower one. And this factor of e to the minus one half was kind of a, kind of a surprise. Um, but even more of a surprise was we, we discovered about a year ago or a little less than a year ago that it seems like all of this should generalize to, um, to non-abelian groups. So that's what I want to talk to you about, um, at least some of the rest of this talk. Um, so what, what actually changes in terms of this heuristic? Well, not very much actually. Um, so psi of x is now the identity times um, this random bijection, obviously. Uh, Model one changes slightly. So now the only thing we know about psi is that the sum of all its values is trivial in the abelianization. We don't know anything about the product of all the values of psi of x because, you know, that depends on the order in which you take the elements of the group and it's kind of unclear what that is. But we do know that the sum of all the values is trivial in the abelianization. That's again a subgroup of the set of all possible functions. It's a subgroup of index equal to the size of the abelianization. So you pick up only a factor of the size of the abelianization, not uh, necessarily n. Uh, model two, model two doesn't change at all. It's still again uh, a factor of e to the minus one half that appears. Nothing, nothing changed about what I said before. So um, this is what we proved. Uh, we proved that if you have a group of order n and it satisfies the whole page condition, then and n is tending to infinity, then the number of complete mappings is uh, asymptotically e to the minus one half times the size of the abelianization times n factorial squared over n to the n. So this is nice because a corollary is just that the whole page conjecture holds. 
So we have an asymptotic to the number of complete mappings. In particular, if n is sufficiently large, um, that's going to be positive. Uh, so the whole page conjecture holds, as long as the order of the group is sufficiently large. Um, and okay, I, I haven't told you much about the proof yet, but um, we're kind of only using counting. We're using some some Fourier analysis. So uh, it it's a completely different bag of tricks from the previous proof, uh, which is interesting. Um, in fact, we can so this this figure of ten to the ten, we um, we we did some more work to try to figure out exactly which groups survive this method. And we came up with a list of, of all the simple groups, which, which our proof doesn't work for. So basically, these groups are the groups that are either too small or they have representations which are too small. But the interesting thing about this list is that um, the, the only sporadic groups which we can't handle are the two smallest Matteo groups, M11 and M12. And all the other sporadic groups, they're, they're sufficiently large that they're included in this analysis. And that's interesting because in the previous proof, it was the sporadic groups which gave people the most trouble. So somehow this proof combined with the previous proof, it's, um, it's you know, we've simplified parts of the, of the actual proof of the whole page conjecture. So that's good. <clears throat> um, okay, so now I want to tell you something about how we actually proved this. So we came up with this, I've told you about um, the heuristics we use to come up with this conjecture, but how do you convert these heuristics? How do you stop doing physics and start doing mathematics, basically? Um, how do you convert these um, heuristics into, into, into something rigorous? And um, so I'm going to spend basically the rest of the talk trying to convince you that there are some mathematics that we can do and to try to draw the parallel between the mathematics that we do and the heuristics that we were talking about before. So what we use is Fourier analysis. Um, and this is very similar to, to the circle method from analytic number theory. So much, so similar that we call it the circle method. Um, and so the, the first thing we do, which is, it almost looks like a step in the wrong direction. And I mean, so far I've been saying you take a random bijection and you add the identity to it. Uh, and you want to ask, is that again a, a bijection? But the first thing we do is we actually add symmetry to the problem. So we, we say that if you multiply this by n factorial, then I can just add another bijection. I can say, if I take two bijections and add them together, what's the probability that that is again a bijection? So it's easy to see that that's exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, minus a bijection is again a bijection. So um, that's where this first line comes from. So the number of complete mappings times n factorial is actually just the number of um, triples of bijections whose sum is identically zero. Uh, I should say that I'm working in the, I'm, for simplicity, I'm just giving you the abelian, abelian case now. And, and later on, I'll, I'll say something very brief about how to adapt it to the non-abelian case. Um, so, um, okay, so there's the number of additive triple, number of triples of bijections whose sum is zero. So in other words, this is n to the 2n times the triple convolution of the indicator of this, this set S evaluated at zero. And that by, by Fourier analysis is equal to um, sums of the cubes of all the Fourier coefficients. Um, so here, as usual, I'm writing one s hat for the indicator function of this of this the Fourier transform of the indicator function of s, which is the average over all elements uh, in s of chi evaluated at x, where chi is a character. So the the dual group here is g hat to the n, 
which is you can think of as n tuples of characters of G. Um, and you want to um, you want to divide so you want to divide this dual group into um, into two halves basically the major arcs and the minor arcs as you would normally do in, in analytic number theory. So the major arcs in this case are basically all um, all chi which are low entropy. So I said that an arbitrary chi you can think of as chi one up to chi n, and you can think of the entropy of chi one up to chi n. And if many of those are equal, then this is going to be this is going to be a, a large contributor to this sum. So the very most basic one is you just take the all zeros character. This will just give you the density of your of your set, which is n factorial over n to the n. And for instance, if I just if I thought that if I just guessed naively that that was the only important con uh, contribution to the sum, that actually corresponds that that naive guess actually corresponds perfectly to what I called model zero model zero earlier, as in that guess would exactly amount to saying we think the number of complete mappings complete mappings is n factorial squared over n to the n. Um, but note that, so for instance, um, if uh, I'm assuming that I'm in a group which does satisfy the whole page condition, which means that the sum of all the values in the group is zero. And then if you think about it, that actually means that this Fourier transform is shift invariant. As in, if I take the all ones vector instead of the all zeros vector here, that's the same exact thing. Because if I have the all ones vector, then whenever I take an element of S, then I get some of all the values in the group and that's zero. So that doesn't matter. So the whole page condition uh, implies that this Fourier transform is shift invariant. So it's not just the z all zeros vector that's going to have the size, but in fact, every constant vector. Um, and there are n of those. So once you incorporate this information, you see an extra factor of n appear. So this corresponds perfectly with what I called model one earlier. But actually, it's not just those um, constant vectors which have large value, but any vector which is sort of nearly constant. So if you have n minus two um, zeros and two non-zero values, then this is actually going to be large. And if you consider all those together, then they're actually going to be large to large enough to be comparable to the main term. So in order to get this to work, you need to you need to go away and compute all these things and add them up. And hopefully what you will see is, um, and we prove that what you do, what, and we prove that you do see it, um, is you should see a factor of e to the minus one half up here, once you add all of these things up. Okay, that's the sort of fun part of the proof. And then the, um, then the sort of work part of the proof is, is bounding everything else. So everything which, your, your bog standard chi is just comes with a bunch of random junk, which doesn't have any, you know, nearly dominant value. Um, and we call all those things minor arcs. And uh, you need to prove that all of these things are sufficiently small that they, that they don't blow away your main term. Um, okay, so uh, I just want to take you through a couple of the simplest cases of these things, just to show you how, how these things look in practice. So I already mentioned this most basic one, which is just that the, um, the Fourier transform evaluated at the all zeros vector is just the density of your set. Uh, and I mentioned this one in passing. So if you have n minus two zeros, you have a character, so this is a character on g hat, to, this character on g to the n, so it consists of n characters on g. So if n minus two of those are zero, and the first two, chi one and chi two, are non-zero, say, then I can write this Fourier transform, well, it's the sum, it's going to be the sum over all distinct x1 into xn. 
Um, but only the first two really matter. And the n minus two other ones, they just amount to this factor of n minus two factorial. So I end up with this much simpler looking sum, which is the sum over distinct x1 and x2 of chi1 of x1 times chi2 of x2. And uh, well, I can, I mean, the sum over all x2 equal to x1 or not, which x1 or not equal to x1 um, would be zero. So this is the same as minus the sum over just x uh, of chi1 of x times chi2 of x. Okay, now this is a ca complete character sum. And so uh, if the character is trivial, then this sum gives me a factor of n. So I get precisely minus one over n minus one times the, the density of the set. But if the character is non-trivial, non then I get zero. Okay, so this, the point is that this is smaller than the main term by a factor of about n. Uh, and okay, so the, there's, there's more to compute here. So what I care about is the sum of the cubes of the Fourier coefficients. Um, and I need to take into account all of these um, characters that look roughly like this. So there are n choose two possibilities for where the non-zero values might be. There are um, n choices for chi one and chi two, such that chi one chi two is trivial. Okay, so you need to you need to add up all of these. But once you do, um, the result will be uh, precisely, I guess, minus one half times the main term. So that's that's the first term in the in the exponential series for e to the minus one half. Um, so after you do that, then you need to consider uh, characters that have three non-zero values or four non-zero values, and they're going to give you the next term in your in your exponential series, basically. So that's that's rough. That's a roughly what the major arcs look like. What about the minor arcs? So um, I'm only going to give you the very simplest minor arc because uh, at least it gives you an idea of what we, what kind of tricks we use to try to deal with these. So if you just consider the most, the most basic minor arc is the one in which all the values are distinct. So literally maximal entropy. Um, there are n factorial uh, of those characters. But just by Parseval, I know that the sum of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients is, is equal to the density of set. And all these characters where all the values are all distinct, those, they all actually have the same value because this thing is permutation invariant. So this, this minor arc that I'm trying to bound appears n factorial times in this Parseval bound. And so I can say that this, the square of the Fourier coefficient is smaller, is, is at most one over n factorial times n factorial over n to the n. Um, and once I take into account the contribution from all of those characters, so there are n factorial of them, as I said, and okay, I had a bound for the square here and really I want the cube. So I need to take the three halves power of this. Um, the result is one over square root of n factorial times n factorial over n to the n to the three halves. n factorial over n to the n to the three halves, that's, that's some exponential size thing. It's e to the minus three n over two, roughly. And this one over n factorial term that completely blows it away. It's really much larger. Um, so that's, that's the very most basic minor arc. Um, right. Okay, so I've got another seven minutes or something. So I will tell you um, just uh, a little bit about what changes when we go to a non abelian group. Um, so we need to use uh, non abelian Fourier, Fourier analysis which is just another term for representation theory, basically. So 
the Fourier transform of our set S. So S is again just a set of bijections from one of the n to, to g, thought of as a subset of g to the n. And the Fourier transform is now defined on some irreducible representation called rho. And as in the one-dimensional case, as in, as in the abelian case, this is the average uh, over the set of the value of rho. The difference now is that rho is, rho is a linear operator. So this Fourier coefficient is actually a matrix. Um, but other than that, it's kind of, it kind of does the same thing. Uh, so again, we care about uh, the triple convolution of the set S. Um, and again, we have the Fourier inversion formula, which says that the triple convolution is given by the sum over all irreducible representations of the cubes of the Fourier coefficients. But these cubes are now matrices. So I now take their trace. And I also get a factor of the dimension. Um, so that's what changes there. So this, this factor of the dimension actually changes a lot. Of, it makes a lot of the analysis. Uh, it changes the technical details of the analysis. Just because um, you know, irreducible representations having dimension greater than one is a feature which did not appear in the Abelian case, needless to say. So, um, okay, and what about translation invariance? So translation, translation invariance was a sort of Fourier version of the whole page condition. So hat 1s is now, it's invariant, it doesn't make sense to translate by arbitrary representations. Uh, it only makes sense to translate by one dimensional irreducible representations. And translate now means take the tensor product. Um, but it is true, so the whole page condition basically states that the Fourier transform is invariant under translations by one dimensional representations. And so we get an extra factor of the abelianization, which is equal to the number of one dimensional representations. Uh, and finally, we have to change what we mean by major arcs and minor arcs. So now something is considered a major arc only if it has very low entropy and if also it has low dimension. So if, if you take a irreducible two-dimensional representation and repeat it n times, that doesn't count as major arc. That's still, that's still minor arc. So those are the adjustments that we need to, to prove the general case. Um, but other than that, everything's the same. And um, so I think I'll just, I'll just say one more thing, which is uh, I mentioned um, when I was talking about heuristics, I was saying that after model two, it's kind of unclear whether you should be, whether you should stop. Maybe there's some model three that has more information. Um, so we, we thought about this and we came up with a, a kind of a systematic way of, um, of doing this rigorously. So it turns out that you can incorporate more and more information and you will learn more and more about the asymptotic. So previously I stated a theorem which said that the number of complete mappings is, is asymptotic to something else, but you may want to know the size of the error terms and so on. You may want to, you may want to know the asymptotic, not just up to a factor of one plus little o one, but a factor of one plus big O one over n and so on. And so we actually showed how you can do this, but it is, it is actually incredibly tedious to do it in practice. There's quite a lot of calculation that, um, that needs to be done. And this asymptotic actually begins to show more and more features of the actual group. So we did it for the one over n level. And at that level, what you see is the number of involutions in the group. So I'm saying in G is, is the, the fraction, is the proportion of elements in the group whose square is the identity. And 
the one over n term in this asymptotic turns out to be a third plus n of g over four, uh, which is interesting. So for instance, this, this implies, um, this implies uh, that the, among all groups of order two to the n, um, only F two to the n has uniquely the most complete mappings because F two to the n has uh, every element satisfies x squared equals one. And any group which is not f2 to the n has at most a fraction a half or three quarters or something, um, elements which satisfy that thing. So um, yeah, and so, and so you could actually do this, you could actually continue this process. You can crank the handle and, and learn more about this asymptotic and you will end up needing to count solutions to more complicated systems of equations in the group, but um, it, it's really quite, there's a sort of combinatorial explosion that um, really prevents you from doing this very long. Um, and I will just end my talk there. So thank you for listening. Let's all try unmuting and clapping. So are there any questions for Sean? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, I have a question if people can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, was it sort of a surprise that it generalized the way it did to the non-abelian case? Or like, is there a good heuristic for what kind of abelian arguments what would work for the non-abelian generalization? Um, I mean, clearly, yeah, it was a surprise. Um, I, if there is a good heuristic, I think I don't know it. But um, for instance, if, if I was giving a talk about our 2015 work and somebody had said, what about non-abelian groups? I think I would have said, no, there's no chance. We're using Fourier analysis. And then hopefully I would have gone home and thought more about their question. and and realized and maybe some things do work and so on. But um, yeah, it, it was a surprise to me, but uh, yeah. Hi, Sean, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah so I was wondering to so this uh, really nice Fourier method, um, how, how might that compare to like a sort of method of moments. So like, if I just want to count the number of collisions for uh, pi, or if I say choose a random function, and then, uh, count the number of collisions of pi, and then pi plus x, because that's maybe another way of thinking about these, uh, making rigorous these heuristics. Yeah. Um, so the moment of methods, um, That's a good question. Um, it's certainly something that's playing playing a role front and center in these heuristic arguments. Uh, and yeah, you can certainly think of this as counting, um, estimating moments of the number of collisions. Uh, And so maybe, yeah, maybe it is possible to view all the Fourier analysis as we do as a very rigorous calculation of moments, but um, um, but it's what I'd say, I guess, is that it's, it's just very difficult to use any sort of um, off the shelf method of moments result to say, um, we've calculated enough moments and therefore the approximation is good enough that we can conclude what we want to conclude. But um, definitely the spiritually, um, spiritually that's what's going on, definitely. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems to be very clean what you do and the, it generalizes so nicely, it seems to be like it's, that's really the correct way of looking at that, this kind of count. Yeah. Thank you, thank you.
Any more questions? Yes. Can I ask a question? Yep. Okay. Uh, have you any ideas uh, how to channelize uh, for a bit of uh, quasi groups or at least loops? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so the question is, can you generalize this to, to quasi groups or a loop? So for people who don't know, a quasi group is kind of just another word for a Latin square. Um, and yeah, it, it is something that we definitely thought about. So once we, once we realized that it sort of generalizes to non-abelian groups, we kind of were tempted, well, why, are, why even stop there? Maybe we should keep going, you know? Maybe it's not even important that, that the group is a group. Um, and what you could ask is, um, there's something called Reiser's conjecture, which states that if you have any Latin square of odd order, then it should have a transversal. Um, and yeah, this is, this, is, uh, this is work in progress. So we've, we've got some ideas about this, but what I would say is, I'm not sure if we actually have a proof of this, maybe we do, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly not true that you have a sharp asymptotic in general. Um, there are certainly, you can certainly construct um, Latin squares where the number of transversals is either much smaller or much higher than you would get, you would guess it is from this sort of, um, from this sort of heuristics. Uh, and part of what's going on is that um, groups, groups are actually very rigid compared to quasi groups. It's possible to take a quasi group and um, ch and change a few entries to get a different quasi group, but you can't really do that with a group. Um, there's something much more rigid about groups than quasi groups. Mm -hmm. Do you know quasi groups with small number of transversals, less small, uh, less uh, much less than the asymptotic given by this method? Sorry. Um, do you know some quasi groups that has transversals much less than asymptotically than the yeah, word so, given within you? <laughs> well, it depends on um, so it depends on what you mean by abelianization. So in, in our asymptotic for the whole page conjecture, we have this factor of the abelianization. And you can def you can define such a thing for the quasi group. You can say, let's take your max let's say your groupization is your maximal group quotient, and then you take the abelianization of that. But what you can define is you can you can define quasi groups that actually have trivial abelianization yes. but are kind of close to another quasi group that has large abelianization. You can, you can maybe not very abelianization, maybe in some parameter okay. <laughs> maybe yeah. but we can another constant. But basically we, we've seen examples where um, where you know even if you, where the number of transversals is, is, is much smaller than the smallest group of the same size or much larger than the largest group of the same size. It's finite examples, not in fin not in infinite series. Finite yeah. examples, yeah. Oh, okay, finite, of course. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions? I have a question. Um, so with your guys' argument, how much of the classification of finite simple groups do you need to prove the Hall page conjecture? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we are definitely using some non-trivial fraction of it, but not all of it. So uh, let's go back to that slide. Um, so I've stated something a little bit crude here. Uh, just, just that it holds for all groups of size order 10 to the 10 or larger. So that, that result certainly doesn't depend on the classification at all. And then if you actually want to know that the conjecture holds for every group, you clearly need, you need to classify groups which are, are most that large, which is not using the, the whole of the classification of finite simple groups, but it is using a, a very substantial chunk of it. Um, uh, well, we can, well, we, we can reduce it 
we can be even more restrictive. So we end up needing just a classification of groups that have either much smaller order, like less than 100,000 or less than 300,000 or something like that, or have a representation of dimension at most 20 or something like that. So I don't know. It's, we're using some some fraction of it, but I could try to argue that we're not using a, a huge fraction of it. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's all clap the second time. <laughs>